Welcome, I'm Kira Carey, and this is CloudSmith's webinar on all things supply chain security and artifact management. CloudSmith is the only cloud native universal artifact management platform for securely developing and distributing your software. So today's topic is on how to securely consume open source, and we'll be joined today by Adrian Mote from Jengard. And we also, we wanna hear your questions, so please post them in your channels, no matter where you're listening, and I'll try to get through them. I'm, I'm terrible at multitasking, but I'll, I'll make a really good effort. So when we talk your software open source, is, it's like 85% of your code contains open source. So your software supply chain includes all your steps involved in deploying your code to production, your closed source, your closed source software, your in-house software, your dependencies, which are likely to be open source, uh, where you host and consume your open source from those public repositories, and where it gets deployed to production, some machines, some cloud somewhere. And there's plenty of risks in your supply chain. The attack surface is quite large. And so we should be worried about supply chain attacks and because they've grown exponentially over the last few years. These software supply chain attacks can target any of the steps involved in your software supply chain. You can have compromised repositories where people are sourcing their open source packages from. You can have compromised dependencies of those packages. You can have malicious packages or type of squad packages. And it can also be you compromise how the packages are built or distributed. And there's also over the last few years, there's been an increased regulatory scrutiny emerging on organizations. They, they have to prove they know what's in their software supply chain. It all started kind of with that White House executive order. It, like whenever we talk about supply chain, we always talk about this White House executive order, but also the EU's Cyber Resilience Act and previously the NIS2 directive, the UK's NIS regulations. Um, so all of these require customers, uh, organizations have a better understanding of what their what is in their software supply chain, the ingredients of your software supply chain. So how do organizations reduce their risk in their open source and secure their open source, securely consume open source? Well, I suppose it's a, it's a big problem. You need people, you need a culture, you need policies, you need processes. And today we're gonna to talk about some of them. So um, let's bring Adrian on stage. Hey Adrian, how are you? Hi there, I'm very good. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, delighted to have you. I, I actually met Adrian last week at KubeCon, which was on, like, had a great time there. How, how did you get on? Yeah, it was great. It was a great conference. Um, I think it was 12,000 people or so. So it was a... Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. Very yeah, big. and you had a talk. You were, like, on the, the massive stage, the keynote stage. I, I would have been uh, pretty terrified. <laughs> but yeah. you were cool and calm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't meant to be on the keynote stage. I just, I got moved room at the last minute. So that was... They were, it was I, an I experience. I wonder if they did that because like people were adding you to their schedules. Yeah. They were like, we've got to get this guy on. Yeah. Okay. No, cool. it was that. They knew the room was going to be oversubscribed. Oh, it wasn't like a mistake then. <laughs> Don't say. <laughs> you were like, you were meant to be there. You were always meant to be there. <laughs> so um, Adrian is a developer relations in ChainGuard. And um, ChainGuard is... Um, Sorry, <laughs> like my, my notes are gone. But um, ChainGuard is a company involved in securing the supply chain. It has like all the top heads of from Google coming in and they created this company a few years ago. And um, out of this, a product called ChainGuard Images got created. Do you wanna, do you wanna talk about that? Sure, um, so ChainGuard Images are basically secure minimal container images. Um, yeah, the main thing is they have much less known CVEs. So if we go and talk about, you know, the scanning software, like uh, I think you use Trivi inside CloudSmith, but there's also stuff like Sneak and Gripe and so on. And if yeah. you run that on your average container image, it tends to have quite a lot of results. Uh, and basically, we just create container images um, that aim to have zero results. They don't they're not always perfect, but uh, a lot of our images, if you scan them at the minute, you'll find there's, there's zero known. 
vulnerabilities, whereas other similar images may have considerably more. Yeah, and um, and originally you had another product, but ChainGuard images really became the focus of uh, ChainGuard. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, we always had ChainGuard images, to be fair. Okay. It, it possibly took us a little bit longer to get that product um, to market because we had to first create an operating system called Wolfie. Um, Easy peasy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I shouldn't say operating system, Linux distribution called, called Wolfie. Um, and we needed to do that for several reasons, but it was it was kind of essential for us to be able to create our own minimal images and also to issue security advisories. So what you'll find is one of the reasons that we're able to have zero CVEs according to the scanners is that, say, there's a, a vulnerability that's a false positive. Um, you know, it, it's something that doesn't actually affect our images. We can issue an advisory that you know, basically says, hey, this is a false positive. The scanners picked it up and they don't flag on it in our images anymore. And why would you consider that to be a fault? Is it because it doesn't touch that bit of code or you're configured? So, so that you... it, well, yeah, so there's multiple reasons. Um, because we supply the container image and it can be used in different ways, we're probably unlikely to say, you know, that bit of code's present, but it can't be reached. because It's still kind of present, I guess. But if that bit of code isn't present, but it may be present in other um, versions of the software, then we could, for example, say that. I think possibly the most common reason is, or I shouldn't say that, it's a bunch of different reasons. But one <laughs> of the more common reasons is, say you have an upstream project, that's a, for example, a Go project. And there's a, a vulnerability in it, but it's not in the code for the project itself. It's actually in one of the project's dependencies. Well, that upstream project might not issue a new release um, for that vulnerability because it's not in their code. So, you know, there's no new feature to release, for example. And they probably would have if it was significant enough. But for a lower vulnerability, the lower class of vulnerability, they may not. Um, so what we would do is we would actually upgrade that, um, you know, the Go mod file and, uh, and change the dependency in our build and release a new version ourselves. And that's another case where we'd issue a security advisory basically saying, hey, we have bumped this so, we'll, so that vulnerability is no longer present. Oh, cool. And um, so you also include a lot of like um, provenance data into your images. Is um, That's a big part of your offering. Do you, uh, what kind of stuff is that? That's a good question. So, I mean, that comes back to where we start from. I'm not sure I actually properly answered your first question. So, um, yeah, we did have another product, which was in force, but all our, and that was to do with like um, insurance security policies were met. Okay. Uh, so it was very, um, what's the word? It worked well with our images, but uh, in the end, we felt that we want to focus on, on one product at the minute. So we're focused entirely on container images currently. Um, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> I skipped that. <laughs> um, it's about Providence, Providence, Providence. Yes. Providence. And I right. suppose that's why you linked it to your You're policy right. manager. Exactly. Yeah, I can totally, yeah. So like the policy manager could say, hey, I only want to run images that I know where they came from that are signed by the person that created them, for example. Yeah. Um, and so all our images, they have, they're, they're all signed using um, the SigStore project. And you can verify the signatures using tools like CoSign. Um, oh, cool. And basically, what that will prove is that the image you're looking at was the same image that we built. So nobody's tampered with it or changed things in it, for example, um, either like you know in the registry or when it was transported. Um, and ha has the industry coalesced around cosine? Because I I hear stuff about notary as well, and sometimes we're we're always wondering what horse to back in CloudSmith. We do support cosine, but we're like, oh, should we also do notary? Should we do this? It's it's um, is it still in flux? <laughs> you're asking all the difficult questions. I'm um, sorry, at the start. No, no, you're okay. Um, <laughs> it's uh, so I'm a Docker captain, and notary is largely used by Docker. Um, well, it was used by Docker. They now moved to Open PubKey, so it gets even more complicated. Yeah. Oh, we need another. But there is Microsoft and um. AWS, I believe, are using Notary. Honestly, like ChainGuard are very involved in SigStore, so I'm a bit biased on that that count. Uh, and I would, I would definitely be looking at SigStore first. 
And one of the things I like most is that the keyless signing, but which I think is also possible possible with open pub key and a slightly different mechanism. Okay. But a uh, keyless signing is really nice. So basically, um, when you sign your image, you don't have to create this. You know, you know, traditionally what you would do is create a public private key pair, and mm. you'd have to keep your private key completely secure. And if anybody if that was ever leaked, then people could sign the images and pretend to be you, and you'd have a very very bad day, or yeah. bad months probably. Yeah. Um, so, what we have in Sigstore is keyless signing, and that's really nice. Um, if you, uh, there are options to use traditional signing as well, but if you have keyless signing. Uh, it's really nice for smaller projects. So I can, I don't have to have this long lived private key. What will happen is when I sign my artifact, it'll ask me to lo log into an open ID provider like Google or so on. And it'll use that to basically bootstrap the trust, if you like. Um, and it'll create a temporary private key based on that. And it will store the, it also, that the fact that this happened also gets stored in a, Oh, what's the word? Oh, fool, uh, record, record, which is yeah, record, exactly, yeah. which is a timestamp of towards the. I can't remember the technical <laughs> name. Um, sorry, you you caught me. <laughs> I wasn't oh, expecting to go in the Sig store, but um, yeah, I really like Sig store. That's the one I know most about. Um, but it's probably worth keeping an eye on Notary and and Open Pub Key as well. I'm definitely not going to say they're they're bad projects or anything. <laughs> Yeah, and now Docker with a new different format. Who I'm, but I think Six Door has really in the open source world. That's what's really been embraced. It's like being used by most of the the well known open source packages. Honestly, what I would really like to see happen is more people verify signatures, regardless of like where they're from and who created them. I, I'm not sure that happens as much as it should. Yeah, um, signing and that was... for signing sake, probably it, it doesn't really get you anywhere unless you have some sort of verification in your pipeline or something like that. Precisely. There's no point in signing things if nobody checks a signature. Um, and that's where, you know, things like Enforce come in, but also there's, you know, there's other projects like OPA, OPA, um, Kyverno, Kyverno, and so on. Yeah. And those can be used to, to check signatures. Um, and I guess I'm sure CloudSmith does something there as well. Uh, well, yes, we uh, we sign everything that's pushed to CloudSmith, right. and so people can verify in our packages at the in our policy manager at the moment. Um, I can't remember <laughs> if we verify who has signed it, but that if it's not in our product at the moment, it's definitely on our roadmap. It's it's the kind of thing a policy manager should have. Yeah. Um, and on that topic, there's also other attestations you can add to images. Um, and one of those that's quite common is, or common for our images, excuse me, is the SBOM or Software Bill of Materials. So all our images also come with a Software Bill of Materials that fully describes all the software in the image and the versions, uh, which I think probably touches on the points you're making in the intro about regulation. Yes, yeah, and I think it is kind of um, honing images seem to be the place where S bombs will start off. But also, you can host them on using Cosign, right? So it's kind of like that's always where to put your S bomb and how to connect it to the actual package or image is is still a problem for other ecosystems. Yeah, so with Cosign, it's really nice. It's quite simple to upload an attestation, and also there's a Cosign copy command command which takes care of. Um, copying your signatures and other attestations along with the image. So you can copy it securely between registries without losing that provenance details. Cool. And so the, the, the title of it is like how to securely consume open source. And um, do you think like focusing on that ingestion is, is um, really important for organizations or it's like before it gets into your supply chain, it's like mm -hmm. a, it's it's always a good time to to uh, to put a, a lot of attention into what's coming into your supply chain. Yeah, absolutely. So if I can, you know, take a step back, you, you touched on a lot of this in your intro, um, but I, I was thinking about it prior to this to our call, and there was a lot of different challenges like around consuming yeah. open source and, and ingestion. Um, so, like some open source projects become unmaintained, um, and unmaintained software is just going to secure, um, just going to accumulate vulnerabilities. But also, the, and there's no one to go to 
to fix it. You can fork it, but that's a huge responsibility. Yes. Um, and so what you end up having to do, or, or the best solution for, for most people, is to move to a different solution that is maintained. But then if you're talking about you know, a large framework, that's a lot of work. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest problems is like, how do you know if your software is maintained and is going to continue to be maintained? And just on that, it, it, I'm sure it's an awful lot of work for Chaincourt at the moment to make sure all these vulnerabilities are fixed. Do you think um, in the future that maybe AI could be used to, to help with this, to like at least maybe, oh, there's this bug was found here. Maybe we can find that same bug in a similar place or maybe something around what, uh, what version it's fixed in, that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, I mean, we're kind of looking at this internally already. Um, oh, cool. It's, yeah. So personally, I see AI as a, a sort of tool that you can use to help guide things, but I don't really see it being let to go off and do its own thing too much. I think it generally is always going to need to be to be guided or to help guide people, if you like. Um, but I think the, you know, the suggestion you had there was, well, hang on, if you find, if you can identify a pattern or if AI can help you identify a pattern of types of bugs and you can find it in a whole bunch of other software. So I think that's definitely a, a one yeah. approach. Um, help you to prioritize anyway what to, to work on. Yeah, well, I mean, that's uh, another topic with uh, the <laughs> NVD um, problems at the minute that we're seeing. Oh, gosh, yeah, that's another <laughs> pothole. To... So if you haven't heard, um, it's, so the whole base of vulnerability management is kind of based on this major a vulnerability database, the NVD database. And um, since February, the organization that hosts it hasn't been, they, they, you can submit a CV, but there's no score associated with it. And this score is really um, important when you're trying to prioritize what vulnerabilities to fix. So it's like a huge problem. And I don't think we know why they haven't fixed it yet or when it's going to be solved. Is that kind of where we are? I think so. I think another part of the problem is that the CPE, like the, the the data for matching, like saying, okay, this this vulnerability effect affects this software package from this version to this version. I think that's also not getting added for whatever reason. And there yeah. have been some reports on blogs and so on. And I'm sure I read something saying they're going to come out with a statement, but I don't think a statement's ever happened. My best yeah, understanding is that it's actually not a budget problem, but some problem in their underlying software that it's oh, complex. Oh, I, di I didn't know that. I, th I didn't, I really didn't think it was going to be a software problem. I thought it was going to be a, like a people problem or a budget problem. Uh, I think but, it's like a out of date database or, or something like that. Oh, I think there's oh no. yeah, some fundamental issues, but we'll see. Okay. We'll find out yeah. eventually, I guess. Yeah. Well, I suppose uh, eventually I, it would be great that if there was a global database, yeah, right. So NVD is national as in United States of America. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think this is a... So, this is a different webinar. Point. This is yes. different. <laughs> well, that's true. But I think that's, you know, you're hitting on a very good point and we need a, a better solution in the future. Um, that's going to take time and I don't know what it is. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to move on. So I'm going to... Um... Well, we can talk about the other challenges. So that's, that's kind of okay. where I was trying to go. So as well as like unmaintained software, one thing that happens a lot is people get stuck in old versions of software and they don't update. And you'll see like sometimes, you know, the latest stable is one version, but like the more popular version is the version before that may not even be as maintained. Um, and I think that's a big issue. Um, again, you can have the, the same problem. Like if it's, a, if it's a large framework, it might be a lot of work to move from one version to another. But when you don't update and you don't move versions, that's when you tend to find your software gets more and more or less and less secure and more and more vulnerable. And um, then it's more and more difficult to update because yeah. you're likely to break something and then you need more downtime yeah, to deal just, with it. Yeah, there's a whole lot of technical debt there. Yeah. Um, typo squatting, you mentioned that one. That one's the yeah. typo squatting and repo jacking and attacks like that are becoming more oh, what's and more repo common. jacking i don't know if i know this one well, well, let me see if i get it right <laughs> <laughs> um, i think that's oh so like say um a company gives up its rights to a repository 
and then uh, because they no longer produce software, they no longer use that okay. package manager, then somebody else comes along and steals that. Um, oh. So a bit like, uh, you know, when you can steal a domain name. Domain, okay, okay. domain tracking? I'm not sure. Anyway, so the same sort of idea. Basically, something that was once trusted, an organization or a repo, um, is now untrustworthy and malicious. But how do you know that? Um, and, you know, similar with typo squatting, that's when you, like, you know, you put... Um, you spell the name of your package wrong and, you know, Redis dash pi instead of pi dash Redis or the other way around or whatever it is. Uh, and you get something that, that looks right, um, but is actually malicious. Um, or it may not even be malicious at this point in time, but at some point in time, the attacker pushes some code that makes it malicious uh, and starts an attack. Um, so that's another big one. But one thing that I was thinking about recently, and that's become really big recently, is it's like companies or projects changing license because that's a big source of um, problems for for companies that are using open source. If the license suddenly changes, can they still use it? And so you, yes. you know, we've seen like Terraform and Redis and Teleport recently all change license. Um, and some in a lot of cases you're probably okay, but in some cases it's annoyingly vague. Like, are you a competitor to, to Terraform? I mean, I can't tell you. Yeah, actually, we have a policy manager, which license we extract all the licenses from your open source, or from whatever code is pushed to CloudSmith, and you can have a policy against that. So you can say, I don't want GPL licenses or something like that in your build. But but then you still you need to find your new. Then you have to replace your package. So that's only the start of the problem. So I ran away with your questions. <laughs> we move on. <laughs> So um, today I was like, look, over the last while, I've been thinking like, what are the best practices for securely consuming open source? And Salsa is a really big one that really focuses on your build. But there's another one that kind of, um, which you can use hand in hand with Salsa called S2C2F. And it's um, secure supply chain consumption framework. It had to be that. We actually had a webinar on it <laughs> a few months ago and we had Adrian, Diglio, we have all the Adrians on this webinar. <laughs> and he is from Microsoft and it came from Microsoft and how they handle, um, how they want to consume open source securely. And they donated this framework to OpenSSF. So I thought it was a good one to, um, to concentrate on. So I'm gonna go through that today. There's like eight practices that organizations should use. And then there's four levels. So it incrementally gets more and more secure as the levels go on. So we have at level one, it really focuses, well, the practices are ingestion, how you consume your open source, inventory, what you're using, updates so that you're hopefully automatically updating your vulnerabilities, at least using some dependabot or something. Enforcement, how do you enforce the developers are doing what you want them to do? Auditing so that um, they're consuming open source from a proven gesture me method you're scanning for vulnerabilities for malware. Um, and then eventually you get to the stage where you can rebuild on trusted infrastructure with the uh, providence data that can be um, verified. And actually the, the, the highest level is like you can fix, you have the potential to fix an upstream, like actually fork it and fix it when necessary for a temporary fix while a zero day vulnerability, maybe if this is on a critical system or something like that, this would not be, you know, day to day thing on, on any old project. But because um, I know forking has its, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's not great to fork and then not bring it back to the upstream. But that was that's the highest level for, I don't know, submarines or something. <laughs> so um, level one, I'll just talk about it because I know we're actually running out of time. Um, Level one is like some of the requirements are they encourage you to it's like basically, you know, where are you getting your open source from? They're trying to encourage you to to tie that down. So you're always using package managers, which is a reproducible way to discover and to consume um, and update your open source. And also package managers and package formats have have extra stuff and more and more stuff about provenance in them. Some package managers, you can actually include an SBOM. You can include your, um, you can sign with, with, uh, with package ecosystem specific stuff. So it's really 
important to use Package Manager. Also, they want you to cache your, your open source somewhere like, like CloudSmith, you can add an upstream and proxy and crash, cache it. They want you to scan for known vulnerabilities for licenses, and they want you to have a good idea of your, to know your inventory of the software that you're using. So like knowing what you're using is actually like a critical baseline that you to establish where you are so you can detect and fix issues that can help you reduce that risk on your software supply chain. And that inventory that's kind of associated with your SBOM, your, your, your software bill of materials. And um, the first level, you could just do manual open source updates, but as the levels go on, they expect you to have automatic um, update capabilities in your, like, so it would automatically open a PR in your code base, something like that would depend upon. And um, the next level is to securely consume um, and have an improved mean time. Um, what is it? MTT or what's that sound for again? Uh, mean time to resolution or does that sound? <laughs> so mean that's time to right. something. Yeah. Yeah, I think. <laughs> So that's focusing on updating your vulnerabilities and fixing them and having that automatic, automatic update capability. The next level will be level three. So you have like, it's more proactive. You might have the potential to mirror your open source internally, to build it yourself if necessary, and to, um, uh, to create that provenance data that you can enforce and also verify. And they also um, expect you to enforce where your developers are consuming their open source on from. So that's the, we're talking about policy manager kind of capabilities there, but also we're talking that provenance data that you were talking about those signatures, creating those signatures, but then also verifying them. <laughs> the hard part. <laughs> And then that level four is what I was talking about before, where you actually have the capability. If a zero day vulnerability comes in, you have the capability to quickly fork it, fix it before the upstream. Um, if, if the upstream is delayed in fixing it, that you would have that in-house capability to, to fork. Now that is kind of on another level, I suppose, <laughs> but it wouldn't be appropriate for, um, for most cases, but this, that's where this, this framework comes up. And so Cl CloudSmith kind of nicely aligns with that because there's a lot of talk about, you know, uh, package managers, CloudSmith supports all your package formats from your NPM to your PIP, talking about caching your open source. And we have upstreams where you can cache and proxy your open source. And actually we can, we can now do that with CloudSmith, with ChainGuard which is kind of cool. Um, you can all, we also do, we scan everything that's pushed to CloudSmith, including your open source that's cached and proxied. And now we have a policy manager on top of that. So um, against your licenses, against your vulnerabilities. And also a new thing is we have a policy manager for your deny rules. So if a log for J came in, you could say, oh, I don't know what to do, but I'm just gonna bar it from anywhere in my software supply chain <laughs> and might give you a little bit of time before you can um, update your packages. Um, yeah, so that's that's where we are. The, we have your ingestion, your scanning, your, um, uh, we are like another key thing is, it's kind of provides that one place for you to, to have all your open source, to have all your, cloud source software in one place where it gives you that vulnerability, uh, visibility to everything that's in your supply chain. And it's like kind of that single place to, um, for policy enforcement, for scanning and to implement controls on your open source. So we have, we scan, we help you ingest, we help you scan, we enforce them with our policy manager, and we also sign everything that's pushed to CloudSmith. So then you can, you can extract that and verify it. Yeah, so we, we do a lot of stuff to kind of help people to uh, um, to align with that best practice of uh, S2, C2F to securely consume your open source. So, yeah. So um, does that kind of, does that, do those steps ring true to you? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I have to say, I've not looked at that standard very much. Yeah. Oh, by the way, if there's some background noise, it's it's raining, but you can hear quite. quite I actually can't approach. hear it. I can't hear it. It's the mic is working. Good. <laughs> Um, what I would say is, yeah, 
we do a lot of that internally ourselves. So, like, you know, we're keeping our packages up to date. And if you're a customer, you buy our production images, we provide you for an SLA. So we'll guarantee to fix the, you know, critical and high vulnerabilities within a, a given time period. I can't remember the exact period <laughs> off the top of my head. But, um, yeah, so we can help you do a lot of that work towards um, S2, C2, F. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I think about um, Chain Guard, I think it it seems to align nicely with with your vision. Yeah, um, so uh, I guess I should talk a little bit about the, yeah. the vision, if that's okay. Please, um, yeah. Yeah, so I think our tagline currently is the safe source for open source, which I, I really like because that gives you an idea of like uh, not just what we do at the minute, but also you know what we can do in the future or what we hope to do. Um, so we really want to be like sort of part of the solution alongside companies like like Cloudsmith for helping companies to trust and safely use open source software. Um, but at the minute, like as we said already, we're hyper focused on chain guard images, which is our low um, CVE minimal secure container images. Um, and yeah, we've got images for stuff like Java, Node, Python, all the sort of programming languages, um, yeah. and you can use those images to build your own software on top of. Um, but we also have application images, so things like Nginx and Redis and, you know, and you know, databases like Postgres, MySQL, um, that you can use sort of out of the box and should be drop-in replacements. But our images tend to be much smaller than, than competitors' image, images and also much less CVEs, and that's what we really aim for. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, as you mentioned there as well, SBOM, so like all our stuff comes with, with SBOM, so you should get a full list of all the software and image. And those SBOMs are created when we build our images. So oh, cool. they should that's be meant to be the, the sweet time to build your SBOM, isn't it? Like app build time. Yeah, because you have all the information then, right? You, otherwise, you've got to go. A lot of SBOMs at the minute are created by sort of looking at the package manager, which yes. works. But you, by, the, by that point, you've already lost some of the information. Of course, yeah. And, and can I ask, on um, do you expect developers to use chain guard images to build, or is it production environment ready? What, who who is the kind of type of person that where is it deployed to? Or? Yeah, both. You, you, yeah. You're quite right. <laughs> so like, um, we have developer images. So we have like you know Java, Node, Python images, and, and there's tutorials on how to use them on our website and so on. Um, and and. By default, if you download like our, so we have a developer tier of, of images that's completely free to use. And so if you download something like our, our Python latest image, what you'll find is that's a minimal image. It's really meant for production usage. So it won't have, for instance, like a shell or a package manager, but okay. there, there's a latest dash dev variant that you can use in development. And that does have things like a package manager. Oh yeah, manager because that's worse when you're working in development and you don't have a shell. <laughs> Like, oh, I'm going home. <laughs> yeah, it's the same with ops. Like, they, they they want to be able to get variants that they can test out and and investigate. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. And um, and so, uh, who who? How do you actually? What are the nuts and bolts in actually finding all the vulnerabilities? Is it is it like just hard graft? Is that? So we don't do the part of finding vulnerabilities. The same as as yourself. So like, yeah. we mainly use rely on scanners so we use gripe internally quite a lot that's the one from anchor it's free yeah. to use you can check that out and but trivi is also a good solution and yeah. then there's commercial solutions like sneak and docker scout uh which yeah, are also aqua great. as well i think is another one yeah there's yeah. even more I, I, I forget them all um yeah, someone sent me on a new one today i hadn't heard of as well <laughs> okay but what i guess i should say is like some people ask us or they don't believe us like when we say we have less cves than other people and they think it's a trick um, it's absolutely not a trick. Um, there's like kind of a few things we do. So the first one is our images are minimal. We follow what's sometimes called a distrolist technique, where you know the only software in our containers is what's required to run that software. So like you know in a in a Redis container we have Redis and Redis is dependencies and nothing else. Um, and just by having less software, there's less software to have vulnerabilities. So that's the first thing we do. But the other thing we do is we just keep things really aggressively up to date. Like when an upstream has a new release, we go and grab it immediately. So the median time from like um, an upstream project releasing something and us having an updated package is about four hours. And then the new container image will be the next day. Um, 
And that, again, you mentioned AI earlier, and we, we are trying to make use of AI to help us um, you know, keep up to date a little bit there. Um, and the last thing, sometimes you still find there's, there's one or two vulnerabilities left, and that's where security advisories and patching comes in. And we talked about that a little bit before, you know, one of the examples being, if you have an upstream project and we want to bump its dependencies to, to address a vulnerability, it's quite a common case. Or we might say, you know, that's a false positive and, and things like that. Oh, cool. And um, is there anything that's hard to find? Like, are there any vulnerabilities that are, because I know I, I, I've, I listen to you guys sometimes and um, it was like, it, if you use some of these uh, scanners, they actually won't find like really obvious things. Like they won't know right. that node is on your images. And why, why is that? Or is that true? <laughs> it can be true. Um, it depends on the scanner and depends how it works. So it actually goes back to the S-bomb thing. Remember I said a lot of the S-bombs are created by looking at um, the package manager. So the way most scanners work is they'll create an S-bomb or an equivalent of an S-bomb, and then they'll compare that S-bomb to their databases. So the problem is it's only going to be able to compare stuff in that S-bomb. And if your S-bomb is created from the package manager's database, then you miss software that's been like added by other methods. For example, it used to be the case like you wouldn't see vulnerabilities in Redis because the official Redis image uh, from Docker Hub, uh, they downloaded and compiled that in the Docker file. Um, and that's how it got in there. It didn't come from Alpine's package database. So the, it, was, it wasn't getting included in the S-bomb for the scanners. And so they wouldn't pick up vulnerabilities, for example. But all of our software is in the S-bomb and therefore should be picked up by the scanners. Cool. Uh, also, you... I, I should say, like uh, I think in a lot of cases, um, the scanners are now picking up binaries. And oh, okay. How are they? I wonder how they're doing that. They're, awesome. I suppose they're just using, uh, they're checking the file system or something. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, some, cool. I think with a Go binary, you can also figure out the, the dependencies and so on. But you know, it depends on the binary how much information you can extract that way. Yeah, I, I sometimes um. I was much better. I'm going to start doing it now again. But um, Open SSF have a um, software repository working group, and they go through how they're trying to up their game in their ecosystem. So these are the public repositories where many people um, consume their open source from. And so they're trying to introduce the these um, S bombs into the package manager themselves. I think um, like. I think Maven is ahead of the game. Maybe Go, um, with with actually include, which makes it That's right. Okay. Yeah. So it makes it easy once you know where you can store your S bomb. Obviously, Docker images you can store them using Cosine. But when if you know where to store your S bomb and it's like beside the package itself, it makes things a lot more usable. Yeah. Sure. That yeah. Makes sense. And have have your customers? Do they have? Um, are they using S bombs in their pipeline to um, to verify what they're using, or to what are they using it for? Right. Um, so this is a question that gets debated <laughs> a lot on social media. Um, honestly, I don't personally see S bombs being used that much. I think they're mainly they're mainly um, in response to regulation at the minute. Yeah. I, I think this may be a little bit of a chicken and egg question because until S-bombs cover everything, how useful are they? Um, like yeah. vaccinations or something. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah. So and I said earlier um, that CloudSmith now um, supports chain guards and upstream. So if you're using CloudSmith, set up your Docker images to point to um, uh, chain guards endpoint and you can consume them that way which is kind of a nice thing <laughs> to have bring everything into one place kind of thing um well let's see uh, we're coming to the end of the show i'm going to see if there's any questions okay this is <laughs> there's just like emojis i don't really know how to <laughs> i'm not sure how to answer that <laughs> but much appreciated i'll just check um linkedin because i think the the they go into the chat there. Okay, let's see. Um, oh no, it's just a lot of thanks and that kind of thing. So uh, <laughs> I think we're 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 good to go. I hope we've re we've helped people um, understand the importance of securely consuming your open source, and we've introduced you to the best practices for consuming your open source securely. 
like know what your know what's in your um your 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 software supply chain to make a big effort that when new open source is being brought in that you're trying to use something with low or no vulnerabilities that you're that you're really interrogating it at that that first point and then also that you're using these s2 ctf practices to um to securely consume your open source you're using a central place for to consume everything including your closed source like an artifact management like cloudsmith you're caching and you're proxying them from public repositories to protect yourself from certain types of attacks and from reliability issues and um, that you're scanning and that you're applying controls and you're creating providence and then also verifying it so it's it's a journey <laughs> and you can make it easier with by consuming these low vulnerability images from chain guard and by using an artifact management system like cloudsmith so I I implore you, I implore, <laughs> I encourage you to explore CloudSmith and ChainGuard to enhance the security of how you consume open source in your organization. So thanks, Adrian. It was lovely to, thanks so much for coming on the show. And it was great to meet you last week. Yeah, fantastic, me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. And um, our next webinar is going to be with the Financial Times, and we're going to go through how um, they responded to the Circle CI breach of uh, by moving away from those long-lived tokens that were um, that were breached in the Circle CI issue, and that um, moving to Open ID. Oh gosh, Open ID. What is it called? OPD ID. <laughs> OIDC. Yeah. Oh, OIDC. That's I what I meant to say OID. earlier. I just said Open ID actually. <laughs> So thank yeah. You. <laughs> yeah, I was correcting you. So uh, yeah, tune in, <laughs> tune in for the next webinar. And again, thank you so much, Adrian. No, you're very welcome. Bye bye. So.